perception is action predicated, but action is goal predicated, right? You act towards a goal. And these propagandistic thinkers that you described, they attempt to unify all possible goals into a coherent singularity. And there's advantages of that. There's advan the advantage of simplicity, for example, which is a major advantage. And there's also the advantage of motivation, right? So if you provide people with a sim simple manner of integrating all their actions, you decrease their anxiety and you increase their motivation. Now, that can be a good thing if the unifying idea that you put forward is valid, but it's the worst of all possible ideas if you put forward an invalid unifying idea. And then you might say, well, how do you distinguish between a valid unifying idea and an invalid unifying idea? Now, Nietzsche was very interested in that, and I don't think he got that exactly right. But the postmodernists, for example, especially the ones, and this is most of them with the neo-Marxist bent, their presumption is that the fundamental unifying idea is power, that everything's about compulsion and force, essentially, and that that's the only true unifying ethos of mankind, which is, I don't know if there's a worse idea than that. I mean, there, there are ideas that are potentially as dangerous. The nihilistic idea is pretty dangerous, although it's more of a disintegrating notion than a unifying idea. The hedonistic idea that you live for pleasure, for example, that's also very dangerous. But if you wanted to go for sheer pathology, the notion that, and this is Foucault in a nutshell, and Marx for that matter, that power rules everything, not only is that a terrible unifying idea, but it, it fully justifies your own use of power. And, and I don't mean the power Nietzsche talks about. His will to power was more his insistence that a human being is an expression of will rather than a mechanism of self-protection and security. Like he thought of the life force in human beings as something that strived not to protect itself, but to exhaust itself in being and becoming. It's, it's, like, a, it's like an upward-oriented motivational drive even towards meaning. Now, he called it the will to power, and that had some unfortunate consequences, at least that's how it's translated. But he didn't mean the power motivation that people like Foucault or Marx was, became so hung up on. So it's not power like you're trying to destroy the other, it's power, full flourishing of a human being, the creative force of a human yeah, being. That, yeah, yeah. Well, way. you can imagine that, and, and you should, you could imagine that you could segregate competence and ability I imagine that you and I were going to work on a project. We could organize our project in relationship to the ambition that we wanted to attain, and we can organize an agreement so that you were committed to the project voluntarily, and so that I was committed to the project voluntarily. So that means that we would actually be united in our perceptions and our actions by the motivation of something approximating voluntary play. Now, you could also imagine an another situation where I said, Here's our goal, and uh, you better help me or I'm going to kill your family. Well, the probability is that you would be quite motivated to undertake my bidding. And so then you might say, well, that's how the world works. It's power and compulsion. But the truth of the matter is that you can force people to see things your way, let's say, but it's nowhere near as good a strategy, even practically, than the strategy of, that would be associated with something like voluntary, voluntary joint agreement of pattern of movement strategy towards a goal. See, this is such an important thing to understand because it, it helps you start to understand the distinction between a unifying force that's based on power and compulsion and one that is much more in keeping I would say, with the ethos that governs Western, Western societies, free Western societies. There's really a qualitative difference. And it's not some morally relativistic illusion. So if we just look at the nuance of Nietzsche's thought, uh, the idea he first introduced, and thus spoke Zarathustra uh, of the Ubermensch. Yeah. It's, it's another one that's very easy to misinterpret because it sounds awfully a lot like it's about power. Yeah, right. For example, in the 20th century, it was misrepresented and co-opted by Hitler to advocate for the uh, extermination of the inferior non-Aryan races. Yeah, and the dominion of the superior Aryans. Yeah, and yeah, well, and that was partly because Nietzsche's work also was mi misrepresented by his sister after his death. But definitely, but I also think that there's a fundamental flaw in that Nietzschean conceptualization. So, 
Nietzsche, of course, famously announced the death of God, but he did that in a manner that was accompanied by dire warnings, like Nietzsche said, because people tend to think of that as a triumphalist statement, but Nietzsche actually said that he really said something like the unifying ethos under which we've organized ourselves psychologically and socially has now been fatally undermined by, well, by the rationalist proclivity, by the empiricist, empiricist proclivity. There's a variety of reasons. Mostly it was conflict between the Enlightenment view, let's say, and the classic religious view, and, and that there will be dire consequences for that. And Nietzsche knew, like Dostoevsky knew, that, see, there's a proclivity for the human psyche and for human societies to move towards something approximating a unity, because the cost of disunity is high. Fractionation of your goals, so that means you're less motivated to move forward than you might be because there's many things competing for your attention, and also anxiety, because anxiety actually signals something like goal conflict. So there's an inescapable proclivity of value systems to unite. Now, if you kill the thing that's uniting them, that's the death of God, they either fractionate and you get confusion, anxiety, and hopelessness, or you get social disunity, or and you get social disunity, or something else arises out of the abyss to constitute that unifying force. And Nietzsche said specifically that he believed that one of those manifestations would be that of um, communism. And that that would kill, he said this in Will to Power, that that would kill tens of millions of people in the upcoming 20th century. I keep he, he could see that coming 50 years earlier. And Dostoevsky did the same thing in his book, The Demons. So this is the thing that the a-religious have to contend with. It's a real conundrum because, I mean, you could dispute the idea that our value systems tend towards a unity. And, and, and society does as well, because otherwise we're disunified. But... The cost of that disunity, as I said, is goal confusion, anxiety, and hopelessness. So it's like a real cost. So you could dispense with the notion of unity altogether, and the postmodernists did that to some degree. But they pulled off a sleight of hand, too, where they replaced it by power. Now, Nietzsche did. He's responsible for that to some degree, because Nietzsche said, with his conception of the overman, let's say, is that human beings would have to create their own values. Because the value structure that had descended from on high was now shunted aside. But there's a major problem with that. Many major problems. The psychoanalysts were the first people who really figured this out after Nietzsche. Because imagine that we don't have a relationship with the transcendental anymore that orients us. Okay, now we have to turn to ourselves. Okay, now if we were a unity, a clear unity, within ourselves, let's say, then we could turn to ourselves for that discovery. But if we're a fractionated plurality internally, then when we turn to ourselves, we, we turn to a fractionated plurality. Well, that was Freud's observation. It's like, well, how can you make your own values when you're not the master in your own house? Like you're a war of competing motivations. Or maybe you're someone who's dominated by the will to force and compulsion. And so why do you think that you can rely on yourself as the source of values? And why do you think you're wise enough to, to consult with yourself to find out what those values are or what they should be, say, in the course of a single life? I mean, you know, it's, it's difficult to organize your own personal relationship, like one relationship in the course of your life, let alone to try to imagine that out of whole cloth you could construct an ethos that would be psychologically and socially stabilizing and last over the long run. It's like... And of course, Marx, people like that, the, the, the people who reduce human motivation to a single axis, they had the intellectual hubris to imagine that they could do that. Postmodernists are a good example of that as well.